This is The Storied Outdoors, a podcast somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark, finding clarity in the stories we tell and the adventures that shape us. Welcome to The Storied Outdoors. My name is Brad Hill, and I'm joined as always by my good friend and co-host, Brian Gill. Man, we are honored today to have Matt McPherson uh, join us today for a conversation. Matt, along with his father, uh, be- began a journey of building McPherson guitars uh, where they merge art, skill, and innovation to create a truly exceptional and inspiring acoustic guitar. Today, McPherson guitars are, are known for having exceptional resonance. I can attest to that. I have a friend that owns one, and uh, he's let me play it before, and they really do have a beautiful, high-quality craftsmanship. And it's a signature. It has that signature hole that you know when you see it. Now, no matter how far away you see it, you know, that's a McPherson. Uh, The McPherson McPherson name has has come to stand for excellence, integrity, and artistry. But one of Matt's other passions and pursuits is uh, from a young age has been bow hunting. With uh, his engineering mind that also builds guitars, he set himself on a course of building bows, uh, having built his first compound bow by the time he was 13 years old. And then in 1992, he invented the solo cam technology. Uh, and there began Matthew's archery. I love this statement you guys have on your website. At Matthew's, we are a family of bow hunters, inventors, producers, and storytellers. We work hard and with enduring passion to deliver the ultimate archery experience for our customers. I love that, and I love what you guys do. And, uh, man, thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Matt. Well, it's my pleasure. Matt, um, I have a, a, a mission, uh, Matthew's mission bow. And, yep. um, I, I've had that for, you know, probably about 10 years now. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I, I didn't realize that that mission was, was an actual mission that you guys were, were embarking on. Um, but it feels like this love of archery started, uh, at a young age for you. Uh, where did that come from? My dad was a pastor when I was uh, young, until I was about three and a half. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, being in being a minister, you know, you make all kinds of money, you know. Uh, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? as I sit here in my church office. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and my father was, he was literally uh, getting $15 a week from the corporate uh, headquarters of the denomination that we were, that he was in. And, and so obviously 15 bucks a week doesn't support a family. And so he had to try to supplement other things. And he was also working at the local creamery. And he also just told my mom one day, and again, I don't remember any of this because I was very, very young, but he just said, I need, we need to get some meat, you know? So he said it was bow hunting, it's deer hunting season. And he's, and my mom says, no, I'm, I'm afraid of guns. Don't, please don't, please don't get a gun and do that. So my dad being the creative guy he was, he went out and bought a bow. You know, I had never done that before. Mm-hmm. And that's what got us into the sport of uh, archery. At a very young age, my dad bought my brother Randy and I uh, these little bows you could get back then. They have little suction cups on them, you know. Mm-hmm. Before kids figured out they could take the suction cups off and shoot other kid in the eye and stuff like that. But <laughs> it's a different you know, time. You yeah, shoot your eye times, Different day. So, mm. Man, both Matthew's bows and uh, McPherson guitars, they're industry standards, you know, in their respective markets. Uh, what drives that pursuit of excellence and craftsmanship or inspires your creativity? And what is, I mean, how does faith play a role in those pursuits? You know, I, I think, you know, obviously there's no question that I, you know, I, again, being raised in a home, my, my father was a, was a pastor. My mom had devotions with us every night growing up uh, when I was very young. And instilled in me that whatever you do, do it with excellence. Even if you don't like it, like my dad had an auto body shop uh, years later and I didn't, I don't like auto body work. And yet at the same time, I had a lot of body men, old body men tell me that I was the best auto body man they'd ever seen. Hmm. So even though I didn't like it, I knew that I needed to, to, to whatever I do, I need to do it with all my heart, you know, all my mind and tell something else, you know, mo- you know, I moved into another category. So I've just always been one to look at, Hey, life is short. Uh, especially now I'm 66 right now. I'm thinking what in the world? I don't feel 66. 
<laughs> you know, um, I, it, it's crazy how fast you get old. And it just all the more has confirmed in me the reality of how important life is and how short it is. And the Bible says that life is like a vapor. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. Mm. And I think it's so true. And so the irony of life is most people, you know, they have the short term thinking um, because, you know, you do need to eat, you know, you need to <clears throat> change the oil in the car when it needs it, you know, little things like that. Those are short term things. But we get so busy with short term things that we kind of uh, start neglecting the long term things that, hey, if there's an eternal life, this life is literally a vapor. And it's what we do here that matters later. So, I mean, balancing those two things um, is something that early on, being an engineer, I'm wired as an engineer and inventor. I take things to the extreme. Uh, if I didn't, I wouldn't be any good at engineering. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I, I take things to the extreme, you know, and it's, if, if I was like an aer aeronautical engineer and I made the most efficient flying airplane in the world, uh, which I could, I could make one more efficient than anybody. I, I, I know I could. However, the wings might rip off after the, after the 60th flight, right? Because it's so <laughs> light uh, and that's why it's so efficient. So you have to take all these things into account and try to balance life with that. So you got to feed, you feed yourself. You got to breathe. You got to, you know, you got to take your family and kids at the same time. If there's an eternal life, I've um, been very much aware of the fact that um, what really matters is what we do that matters for later. So I, I've stayed focused on making the best product, whatever I do, I want to do the best, even if it's a price point, like the mission line, that was a price point. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make the best bows for that price point mm -hmm. uh, that dollars could, could buy. And so we work really diligently and hard on, on, you know, making things that when people look at them, they go, you know, there's thought put into here. And uh, of course that's how you build a brand. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, I it. It, it's very evident that you take pride in what you do. And it, it feels like it comes from a deeper, uh, deeper sense of, of purpose. And, um, you know, you, my job, I, I work at Samford University and my job is the director of faith, learning and vocation. And we talk a lot about vocation outside of the context of a ministerial calling uh, for, mm. uh, and, and, and so, you know, we're each, we each have an individual calling on our life and, you know, uh, you're you're on your uh, on your website. It says that after uh, you built your first bow, you discovered your life's calling. Can you kind of speak to that of of that idea of like you're not called to be a minister that's in a church like your father, but this is a this is a, a an area where you've been gifted in certain ways and and you see it as as such. Can you speak into that a little bit? Yeah, you know, again, I gave my life to Christ when I was about four years old. I remember thinking, I, I can still remember kind of the, the, the thoughts I had as a little four-year-old thinking, I can believe I'm not good enough hmm. and that I need a Savior. And so, you know, gave my life to Christ when I was very young, like right around four. And I think because I started out so young and so many years of really seeking God as a child, uh, again, looking for the important things in life. And again, I think it's partly because of how I'm wired but I, I look for what's what matters. I look for the most important things, even as a child, I did. Um, and I always felt God's presence. Um, and I, I would hear his voice at times. Mm -hmm. And in the late seventies, I mean, I knew that I was going to be involved in ministries. I just didn't know what that meant. You know, and when you're young, you're thinking, well, I've got to, you know, probably go to Africa and eat monkey eyeball soup and, you know, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> But, we always go to Africa, like when we. Yeah, and it's it always called, monkey. It's always Africa. Monkey eyeballs, you know, <laughs> you, you know for some reason. And it's the worst dish possible. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, but the reality of it is, as I got older, I and and just understood more of how God moves and how He uses people. I realized that man, He can use anybody in any position. He can use you as a janitor in a school. Mm. And there's people, there are janitors. I'll guarantee you that have impacted people's lives eternally. Mm. I don't know them personally, but I guarantee you there are. There yep. are. Yep. Um, so my, my point is, I, I just was praying uh, and just seeking God about, God, what do you what do you want from me? Because 
I don't want to miss what you want for me because I know that you probably have a better idea how to maximize my life. So uh, I'm going to go with that. Mm. And I heard him speak to me one day. It was just right out of the blue. And um, I was just surprised because I thought that's God. But I heard him say, I'm going to prosper you in business mm. so you can be self-sufficient in ministry. Mm. And it was just, it spoke to me immediately. I thought to myself, man, you know, in the ministry, you know, the ministries, they have to ask for money and it's tough for, for, I mean, I got several pastors on both sides of my family and it's, you know, it's a tough road to hope. People don't realize what pa pastors have to go through to try to raise funds and, and always feeling like, you know, man, I hate asking and, 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 uh, and I just, when I heard God say that, I was like, yes. I'm no good at begging and uh, or or asking. <laughs> I just don't like it. I just don't like it. But uh, I love to give, and mm. so we, you know, we grew up poor, frankly. Um, so what's interesting is by growing up poor, and again, me analyzing everything to death, um, I started hating money. Mm. I hated the fact that we needed money to be happy. Mm. as a family it put so much stress on our family seven kids my mom and dad they worked their butts off and always working super hard and just struggling to just put food on the table my brother randy and i we were the two oldest i'm second oldest uh we worked uh, 50 60 hours a week in in the auto body shop uh, and never got paid a dime uh throughout junior high and high school because we were just doing what we needed to do to put food on the table which many farm kids know you know what yeah. that's like and a lot of a lot of kids around the world have done that, obviously, but it uh, it really instilled in me the reality of uh, life is serious. You got to take it serious. You get one shot at this, and if you mess up your life, um, God always has a new plan, but it's not as good as the plan He had before this. So, so when we're born, mm. he, God's got an A plan. Mm. I don't mm. think any of us are on the A plan anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're probably on the Z plan or the, the double Z plan. The double you know? Z, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the reality of it is this, it's still at any point of our life, and this is what's so beautiful, at any point of our life that we decide we're giving God our all, he will make something beautiful of what's left. Mm. Mm, that's good. If you have if you have somebody listening that's still trying to figure out that purpose and they're, you know, they're, they're calling, um, what, what would be some advice that you would give them? As a young man, I remember um, I had opportunities, you know, in, in high school. I mean, I'd be in gym class and I would be one of the top sprinters. I set the school pull-up record. I could wrestle just about anybody. And um, the gymnastics teacher wanted me. The wrestling coach wanted me. The track, you know, uh, coach wanted me. I said, I can't. I got to, you know, I got to work. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, you know, it's kind of sad that I'm not able to be, kind of be a kid, you know, here. But I kept on saying over and over again, be faithful in little things and I'll be trusted by much. Hmm. And uh, I believed it and I've lived it now. Hmm. You know? hmm. uh, and I, I just, I feel like, you know, whatever you do, you do it with all your heart and Whatsoever state I am, therein to be content, the Bible talks about. So wherever you're at at the moment, don't be miserable. Just mm. make the best of where you're at. And just like yeah. when I was an auto body, I, I determined I'm going to be the best I could possibly be in auto body. And ironically, all these years later, I realized that's what helped me shape the guitars. That's what helped me shape the bows. Because mm. I would take cars that were smashed and, and I had to shape them back like a sculptor into uh, looking like they'd never been touched. And that really was quite the training. And um, all those things that 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 we went through, uh, my brother Randy and I, uh, it made us entrepreneurs. My brother Randy started a, a company called Abra Auto Body, and you know it's a national auto body chain now. And uh, we were both kind of driven because of our upbringing uh, to uh, become entrepreneurs. And I see how God has used it for me and for my brother Randy. And our most important goal in life is, I, I, I'm just being honest with you guys. I believe there's a heaven and I believe there's a hell. And me personally, I uh, don't want anybody to go to hell. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want anybody to go to hell. There's a few of them that maybe deserve it for a few minutes, maybe even a few hours, maybe even a few days. Mm -hmm. 
but hell I believe is going to be so torturous. I can't imagine sending anybody there myself. And I've had people say, well, Matt, how can a loving God send uh, somebody to hell? And I said, listen, God doesn't send us to hell. He made a perfect world. We wrecked it. We're born on a bus on the way to hell. And God stands at every street corner pleading with us to get off the bus. If you never got off the bus, did God send you to hell? Or did the, or did you, through your own uh, you know, ignorance and, and selfishness, send yourself to hell? So mm. I really believe that we have this one opportunity in life. And I just, I want to hear someday, well done. Mm. Amen. Gosh, that's great. Amen. Matt, behind you is a, a row of just beautiful instruments. Um, I, uh, I, I told Brian, I was like, dude, I'm gonna have to like restrain myself cause I could geek out over guitars, uh, with this guy for, for a long time, but just for, uh, just for a second, I just want to indulge for a moment. I, I've been a worship leader for 20 years. I know that's something that, uh, you guys do and take part in as a musician too. Um, what are some of the things that you never thought you would be able to do that you've been able to do with those guitars and the, the work that you've done with those guitars? Perhaps people or musicians that some of your favorite musicians that you've encountered that you would never have encountered. I mean, anytime you do something uh, with excellence and again, guys understand that I, I literally prayed that God would give me his wisdom in designing the archery bows and the guitarists uh, so I feel in a lot of ways, I feel like a curator of a, of, of a museum, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm the one that takes care of it, but God has entrusted me with it. Uh, but it was just like one idea after another, he gave it to me and I saw how they developed into a guitar that had tremendous, the best sustain of any acoustic guitars out there Yeah. and uh, sustain on a guitar for the most part, unless you're playing maybe blues and there's certainly ways of playing blues, even with a guitar that has a lot of sustain. Uh, you can play just about any style. You can really play any style on these guitars. Something that has a wider dynamic range, has more sustain. It It's like if you've been running all your life in sand <laughs> and somebody comes along and says, hey, dude, you got to try this. You got to try running on this. It's it's a running track, you know, and you sprinted on a running track after sprinting all your life on sand. You would feel like you'd been set free. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is if you have a guitar that I, I work, I was a pedal steel guitar player also, pedal steel, you know, where it's got legs, you oh, got yeah. pedals and all that. And so my ear is super critically tuned to pitch. And uh, guitars have always driven me crazy because most are, you can't tune them very good. And so I, I've uh, worked very, very, diff uh, very, very diligently on making them some of the most in tune guitars in the world. Um, so if you have a guitar that's really tunes well and it plays amazing and it sounds amazing and it has huge long wide dynamic range and it has this long sustain, all of a sudden you've been you feel like you've been set free and now you're not focusing so much on trying to get good sound out of your guitar. You're just basically playing from your heart. More time for the heart and less time. <laughs> to figure out technically how to play it. And you, you being a guitar player, Brad would know that. Yeah. I live, uh, man, I lived down in Mobile, Alabama and, uh, lived here for a long time. And, um, when I first came here, I went to the university of Mobile. It's a small Baptist college down here. And, um, of course, back then integrity music was here in Mobile and, uh, I crossed paths a couple times with Steve Merkel. I, I just talked to him about a month ago. I think you know Steve, uh, yeah. great great musician and and luthier in his own right, and just a great guy. And I remember uh, him saying similar things about about tuning and an instrument that stayed in tune. I know that's something that was a passion of his. But yeah. uh, I was thinking about that uh, today as we we're getting ready. I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I remember uh, Steve Merkel and his his words about guitars and guitar guitar building. And then also there's a, uh, the only one I've ever played or seen is, uh, uh, Steve Bowersox is a worship leader here in town. He also teaches at the university of Mobile and he has a really, really beautiful, um, McPherson guitar. That's uh, it's a wooden, wooden one. Yes. Yes. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I love, uh, I love those instruments and man, I just love what, you know, what you guys do. And, uh, I just, I appreciate the sentiment, not just of, uh, you know, the, the excellence, uh, you know, do whatever you do, right? We, we talked about what scripture says, whatever you do in word or deed, do as unto the Lord. And I just love, you know, you look historically, music used to be great. Music was driven by 
the church. It was driven by, you know, believers that are, are writing music out of the overflow of uh, a worship of what God has done in their life or, you know, the great paintings, a lot of the great paintings and artworks are found in churches out of the, the story of, you know, of scripture that we have driven innovation. And then somehow we let the Lord, we let the world take over innovation. And so, man, I always really appreciate, you know, uh, companies like yours that are, are making something with excellence and they don't slap a, they don't cheapen it by going, Hey, this is a faith based thing. No, this is just a really good thing. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a good guitar builder. I'm not a Christian guitar builder. I'm a guitar builder that loves Jesus, right? And out of the overflow of that. So sometimes I think it, things can be cheapened, you know, by saying, hey, this is a faith-based thing and, you know, buy it, you know, because it's a Christian-made thing. No, we should buy it because it's really good. Christians should be building the best. Absolutely. And so yeah, I, absolutely. I, I see yeah. that in you. And, uh, man, I just re respect that and appreciate that, uh, that uh, dedication to excellence in both of those businesses, man, really, really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally echo that with with the our response to the Lord with our gifts should be excellence, um, you know, and it's not a matter of, oh, we get a pass, you know, the Lord's going to take whatever I give, and, oh, you know, this, that. Well, yeah, but it should compel us to be the best. It should compel us to strive for excellence, Um because of our, of what the Lord has done for us. You know, uh, yeah, I, go ahead. I, have people, I do have people that come to me quite often because I'm, you know, anytime you're a successful businessman, you're going to have people asking you questions because, which is, it's, it's a good idea for people to do that. You know, they seldom listen because they think they've already got it figured out, but uh, they come to me with ideas. And, and the first thing I ask them is what are you doing? That's extraordinary. Hmm. And they almost never have an answer. And right away, I know that they probably won't succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, in this in this world, especially in this world now, if you don't if you don't set out to be extraordinary, you will be ordinary at best, mm -hmm. and very likely you won't succeed. And uh, if you set out to be extraordinary, you still may never make the grade, but you can't you can't hit a target you don't aim for. Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage people when whatever you're doing, uh, even if it's a service uh, business. Um, find out what all your competitors do and lay it out and make sure that whatever you do, it's at least a step better. And that's how you, that's how you become successful in any kind of business. Even if it's uh, like I say, even if it's just a, a cleaning service or something like that, mm -hmm. you just figure out what's been done and uh, you then uh, set out to, to do it better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty much anything can be improved. Anything can be one-upped and, and then that's how you market. I know that with your work uh, with Bose and, and the, the connections that you have, you you've been all over the world and you've seen places of beauty. Um, where of all the places that you've been, where's one place that has just stopped you in your tracks and you just thought, wow, that's go that's beautiful or that's god is a big god you know that's a great question you know certainly going out into colorado in the mountains uh, would be one of those places yeah. in wyoming and montana uh, i do love big wide open spaces i mean there's something so freeing about that uh, but believe it or not, I absolutely love where I live in Wisconsin. Mm. It has these rolling hills that are just shy of what you would call a mountain and filled with just absolute all this hardwood timber and all the colors and, and the pines. And then mixed in there are cutouts where they have uh, cropland. And it's just it's just so beautiful to see the cropland weaving in and out of the woods. You get on top of one of these uh, these large, you know, uh, well, hills, I guess you call them, but uh, they're several hundred feet high. I mean, you know, and you can see quite a ways and it's just kind of breathtaking because you can see for miles and miles and you see just a continued rolling of the hills. And once in a while on a, on a morning where the, when the, uh, you know, the clouds are hanging low, you know, mm -hmm. and you get above it. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're just seeing the peaks. It almost looks like you're looking at islands in on an ocean. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I, I have a friend of mine who owns a ton of land in Montana. Um, it's in the hundreds of thousands of acres. And uh, 
he has come to see me several times and he's, and I brought him through all this area of winding Hills and stuff. And he says, Matt, I think, I, I think that's the prettiest land I've ever seen. Hmm. Wow. So, as funny as that sounds, here's a guy that owns <laughs> mountains, you know, yeah, and, right. and, uh, to say that. So, but you can't necessarily say something's better than another, but yeah, because they're different, you know, mm -hmm. I, honestly, I find something very peaceful and relaxing about Arizona, you mm -hmm. know, the desert. Yeah. I can see um, that. I Those don't sunsets know it, are incredible. Yeah. I don't know exactly what it is other than there's, there's a, it's kind of a beautiful desolation. I don't know how to say it. Yeah. You know, other than oh, that. Man. And I look at how varied uh, the world is. Um, uh, and I just, I, I marvel at it. Yeah. yeah you, driving cross country. I mean, the, our country is so wildly unique from one end to the other, from an ecosystems, you know, even in our own state of Alabama, where Brian and I live, I mean, I live down here on the coast. Brian lives in the other end of the state up, up towards where we get some more elevation change and, uh, you know, hills or mountains, more mountainous areas. I live close to the Delta here in Mobile where this, you know, swampland and rivers, but you can drive cross country and it just changes so much. And man, I just, I'm thankful we live where we live because not every, everywhere has that, but you're right. You can go from deserts to mountains to cropland. So, you, so many beautiful places. Have you ever seen the badlands of South Dakota? <laughs> that is on my bucket list. Yeah. man. got to do it. You feel like you're on Mars. Mm. I, I mean, I've seen pictures. I mean, it just looks like it's otherworldly, like you're saying. Yeah. You feel like you're in Mar on Mars. And so, I mean, I just find it. I think when God said, I, I made you in my image, I believe it's the, the does it, the, the, a lot of the desires and likes and, and the thoughts that we go through are what God goes through. God can get bored. I'm sure. That's why he made such a variety of people. He could have made everybody look exactly the same, but <laughs> variety is good, you know? Um, and uh, to make the different plants and the trees and the different terrain. I mean, it's just, I constantly look at all this and be, as an engineer, okay, um, I can I can honestly tell you it is crazily mathematically impossible to not have a not not be a god. It's just yeah. imp absolutely impossible. Yeah. Uh, just taking the anatomy of the human being, you know, I mean, we we've got two eyes because those eyes triangulate and they tell distance. Close one eye and try to touch something really quick with your finger. <laughs> you might think you're touching it. You're two inches away still mm. with two eyes, your, your brain. And so not only do you have two eyes that triangulate, but then you have a software built into your brain that learns how to uh, quickly uh, calculate for distance. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. It yeah. takes so much. It would take so much more faith to not believe in God. So yeah, indeed it's it, all, all that does when I see all that and I marvel at that is it just substantiates my drive to do what matters in this world, to, to make the next world difference. You know, my, my biggest, my biggest heart, my biggest calling is to lead as many people to Christ as I can in a lifetime. Mm. And um, Man, we amen. were involved in a lot of huge projects, huge projects. Mm. Amen. Uh, there's a line on, uh, in your, I think it's on the Matt. Yeah. The Matthews website. Uh, and it talks about, uh, um, the, there's a an escape from the rigors of modern life and fulfills our unrelenting quest for adventure. Um, where do you think that like I, we have a desire for adventure? Um, where does that? Where do you think that comes from, Matt? I think it again. It goes back to God. God said we were made in His image. Uh, if God didn't have that venture, He would have never made us. He never made this universe. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think God loves adventure too, and I think He loves to do things perfectly. And yet, at the same time, he he uh, he realized that uh, we we need free will, or or it means nothing to him, if we if we choose to serve God, and, and but we have no free will, it's meaningless. It's it's like your mother coming up to you someday and saying, "Hey, hey, Brad, you know, I I, I feel like I need to tell you this. I I do love you. I've always loved you, but uh, I have to love you. I have no choice." Mm -hmm. You would prefer her not say that last line. <laughs> and and so you would rather have the potential that your mother could choose to not love you because mm -hmm. now it means something. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. 
if your mother had no choice and she had to love you, then it really doesn't have depth to it. There's no real depth to the love. It's so robotic, you know, it's robotic. And so God made us with the same thing. And, and people say, well, you know, why did God, uh, why did God make it so that the world could be evil? Well, he didn't, he made a perfect world. We ruined it. And then he set out to, to redeem us through Christ. And I find that beautiful. Amen. Amen. Why, uh, furthermore, why is uh, the other thing that you talk about is like telling stories? Why, why, what's important about story and why is that, why is it important for you guys to mention that on a, a website that sells bows and arrows? We, we all have huge imaginations. And when we tell stories that include you, where you, where you automatically are included into the imagination, our brains take over from there. And it, they're way more powerful than if we'd given you the exact. That's why a lot of times uh, our photos are, you don't see the face of the person. You're putting yourself in that place. Mm. Um, oh, that's intentional. Okay. It's intentional. Wow. And, and oh. marketing is another thing that uh, I'm, I'm kind of... It's natural for me, and and I've got some of the the best marketing people that I work with. Oh man, yeah, I would I would just compliment you as I went through both websites. Man, they're just both beautiful and stunning. Right. Very, you know, well, very well, put, you know, excellence. We've been talking about that a bunch. So it, yeah, it doesn't stop at the the product you offer, but the way that you uh, tell the story about them. And so, yeah, you're right. Story is so uh, vastly important to share stories. You know, whether it's you know about a guitars or or, or bows, like I, it's natural. We're, we're people that love story. I think, you know, it's, it's written on our hearts that we love story. Well, you know, the Bible also says, as you think in your heart, so are you. Mm. When you get to people to think in their own heart, Hey, I love hunting. I want to go out and do this. The more they think about it, the more they're likely to possibly probably go out and do it. Mm. And we know not only as does it sell product, but it also creates memories that are beautiful for so many people, so many friends, so many families, so many uh, bonding between children and, and parents, you know, I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to work in something, making things that help make beautiful memories. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than just like making Kleenex or something, right? Yeah. 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 Which I'm okay with that too, though. I mean, you know, we need Kleenex, but yeah. when you have a brag product, I call this a brag product. It, it's a lot more fun to market. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Matt, we, uh, we, Brad and I like to refer to this podcast as a digital campfire. You know, if we're sitting around swapping stories, you got the rolling hills in your backyard there. Uh, is there a story that you would tell that's a, uh, you know, what would the story be? That's kind of a, I can't believe we made it out alive or a close call that, that you could share with us around this campfire. Uh, you mean as far as hunting or business or what do you, what do you, uh, let's go with hunting. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I was up moose hunting one time, uh, with a bow up in Canada and one of the guys that was in camp with us, um, he had, um, uh, he hadn't tied the boat up very well. So the boat kind of floated across the lake and the lake was probably about a mile across and there was ice on some parts of the lake. So it was very cold out. And he, he said, Hey, Matt, jump in the canoe here. And, you know, with a motor on the canoe. So a motor canoe, that's already always a bad idea to begin <laughs> with, you know? And, uh, you know, we ended up, uh, getting all over, all the way over to the side and he jumped in the other boat and the waves had really picked up. I mean, it was getting to be a little ridiculous. And so you're sitting in the back of the canoe. The front end is already not weighted down very well. You got a motor and you in the back. That's me. And he takes off and I'm, I'm trying to na navigate this thing and kind of go, you, you gotta, you gotta, you can't necessarily go straight back because of, you got to deal with the waves. Yeah. And there was a way that just picked the front end up and rolled me over into the water. And now oh, this is, again, there was man. ice on this lake. And uh, my brother, Randy, uh, who's, he's one, he's 14 months older than me. He, uh, he, he just all of his life was watching out for me. You know, I was not one of, one of those people that was in trouble very much. But he just always being the big brother, he was watching from the other side and he saw the thing roll over. He jumps in another boat and gets it running and he comes scooting across there and uh, gets me out of the water. Um, and I could barely stand up. I mean, it was all the strength I could to just stand up. I had been sapped of all my strength from the cold. And I'm I'm on the way back in the boat, and my brother says, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" I said, "Yeah, I feel good. I feel actually I feel kind of warm." And then I realized, "Oh, 
Yeah, that's the first sign of hypothermia. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're starting God. to feel warm. That means you're dying. You yeah, know? <laughs> not a good and, sign. Uh, and so I well, got back to camp, of course, changed out into dry clothing. And I, it literally took me about two days to warm up to my core. So I don't know what temperature I went down to, but I do know it took me about two days. I was literally Ooh. filled to my core for about two days. And that was the, the closest thing where I thought, you know, I could have died. And uh, uh, I didn't even tell my wife for three years, you know. <laughs> He's like, what? Yeah, don't tell mom. <laughs> yeah, don't tell mom. Don't tell mom. Uh, and it's so funny. But uh, Did you yeah. end up killing a moose on that trip? We didn't. You know, it was one of those things that uh, the um, Canadian government sent me a little, little uh, fill-out sheet later to say, hey, what did you think of the hunt, you, you know? And I said, it, it was awful. You you had all the locals go in with guns and shoot up the woods uh, like a few days before the bow hunters could start. I said, the moose go deep, you know, deep seven. Yeah. And, wow. and now try to find a moose. Uh, we're up to that point. They were coming out to the lake, to the water, you know, on the, on the little peninsulas and that. And so I said, you, you can't, you know, you, you made us pay for uh, guides and all the money for the licenses and that. Locals had 35 bucks and they had a moose hunting license and they were out there blasting up the woods before archery. I said, you know, honestly, let archers hunt first. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it was a little bit of a frustration for me. Uh, again, I, you know, I, I didn't take it too seriously, but it was just, it was frustrating because to go through all those hoops to just have the moose just go, just go, oh, dark 30, you know? Mm -hmm. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, I've finally got to see a moose in person a couple of summers ago me and my family drove out to rocky mountain national park and oh, we yeah. saw we saw a moose in the park uh, uh a cow with a calf but it, even far away i was like that is an enormous enormous creature they are big they're like on stilts you know yeah <laughs> they're like a cow but like on pilings you know? no kidding <laughs> yeah, it's like they're walking around with a sheet rocking uh you know those little stilts they put uh, on sheet rockers. You know for yeah, it's oh like they're walking around goodness. those things. You know? Gosh, yeah, that was pretty incredible. That's a were you jackhammering? I've heard people talk about that when you're jackhammering when you're so cold that your whole oh, yeah. body is like, gosh, yeah. man, yeah, that yeah. Was... It was it was crazy, and I thought, you know, I could have died. Uh, mm. I remember, I did remember thinking though, you know, might have been a fairly decent way to die though. Mm. <laughs> Outside of the initial shock. Uh, your body actually starts getting warm and you start feeling, that's why they find a lot of people that are frozen to death. They've actually ripped their clothes off. Ripped their clothes off. Yeah. I've heard that. Because hmm. they feel like they're getting hot, you know? Yeah. Um, wow. they're just trying to cool off, but, uh, well, praise God for your brother. at that point, they've lost their ability to think straight, you know, because um, logically you would know, don't take your clothes off, but yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank Thank goodness for your brother, huh? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Matt, leading two distinctly different businesses, um, different staff, I'm sure, different creatives, different processes. Yeah. That gives you some pretty unique perspective. Uh, what are some sort of leadership practices that you see overlap between the two and the way you interact with, with Matthews Archery and McPherson Guitars and the way you run business? You know, I always look for people who are self-starters. I think that's so important, especially if especially if they're in any leadership position, they have to be self-starters. Uh, some people, if you tell them, to, hey, you know, sweep the floor, they get on sweeping the floor and you, and you come back, uh, you know, from being gone for an hour or two and they're standing there. And, and well, they swept the floor. Well, mm -hmm. look around, you know, mm -hmm. do the windows need to be cleaned? You know, do the baskets need to be emptied? So when you find people that on their own are self-starters and you come back and they've done all that, you're going... I mean, this is a keeper. This is a keeper. Mm. The people that just sweep the floor and they stop and don't even come and ask for, uh, you know, more direction. Those people are looking to do the minimal in life to get by. Mm. And those typically are not your good employees. They can, they can do okay in assembly line stuff because they got to keep up. So I'm not saying there's no jobs for them, but they're not likely ever going to, uh, basically, um, excel or move up in a company so i look for people who are self-starters and i look for i look for people with good intentions um people that i'm interested in people that aren't trying to be important but are trying to do what's important mm -hmm. that's good Man, i like that that's a great line that's good that's 
Yeah. I mean, can you teach that? That's the thing. I, I mean, as a parent, you know, I've got a 10 year old and a 14 year old. It's like, are you born with that initiative or is that something that you, you know, you learn through, you know, parenting through your parents? And you, I don't, I don't know. What do you think about that? I definitely believe there's a percentage of it is genetic, but I think that's the smallest percentage. Uh, you'll find that there's just an exorbitant amount of farm kids that come off of dairy farms especially dairy farms because they're they're they got to be you know they got to get up at five o'clock and milk the cows come in the house clean up go to school come back in the evening uh, milk the cows and clean up and go to bed and get up and do it all over again you find that there's just a super high percentage of farm kids that have uh, been raised you know in my experience dairy farmers uh who are just if they come in and they said um Hey, I'm 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 looking for a job. Where have you worked? I've worked for my father on a dairy farm all these years. You're hired. I don't know where I'm going to put you, <laughs> but I'm hiring you. So that tells me that it's really more than anything. It's trained. It's yeah. not genetic uh, so much. I do believe some people genetically are more driven than others, but circumstances still play into that tremendously. Mm. They play into that. Mm. That's good. Matt, one of the uh, the last questions that we like to ask each of our guests is, what's your next adventure? Uh, you know, we call this a podcast somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark. And That's so it could, it could be anywhere in that range, but what would be your next adventure? By the way, I love all those guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Driven people. And uh, they, they made a huge difference. They made a huge impact. Well, you know, I've always, I've always believed that, you know, we can be completely ordinary people and do extraordinary things if God is in it. Mm. And so I've challenged God from a very early age, God, use me, don't pass me by. I've said it over and over again, God, don't pass me by. Cause I know mm. he doesn't need any of us. Right. I mean, mm. think about it. He doesn't yeah. need any of us. He can do anything right. he wants anytime he wants, but it's like, are, are both of you parents? Are you fathers? Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's like when your little son or your daughter came up to you when, when they were like one and a half or two years old, maybe even three years old, and you're working on something and they're, they're curious about what's daddy doing, you know? And, and you look down and, and they're, frankly, they're kind of in your way many times. Right. But <laughs> you delight in the fact that they're there yeah. and they want to be with you. And so you might even say, Hey, could you hand daddy that, you know, that, that tape measure or something, you know, and the look on their face when they reach down and they grab that, and hand it to you like they've just they've just participated in what dad's doing is makes me start crying because it's yeah. beautiful thing mm. i believe it's very much that way between god and us and, and ironically uh there's a much much bigger uh, void of of intelligence between us and god than there is between our two-year-old and us yeah so here's yeah. here's god with just unbelievable um uh, ultimate intelligence um still wanting and desiring us to be a part of his, his life. I find that so beautiful. And mm. so I look at life as a gift and I say, you know, God, use me. Uh, I've actually prayed the prayer of God. I would love to be the person that led more people to Christ than any other human being in the world. I mean, of, mm. of course, why not dream big? At least I don't think God gets angry at anybody who, who at least asks for things that, that change lives. You know what I'm saying? God loves people. And if you love people, God pays attention to you. Yeah. That's how that works. And so one of the things we're working on right now, I, I uh, my wife and I wrote a salvation poem song uh, back in like the early 2000s. I remember I was in the, in the porch of my house, my log home. I love log homes. And I said, God, give me an idea to change the world. I make bows. I make guitars. I know you do. You know that I know you've helped me with that, but give me an idea to change the world. And I heard him say, okay, I mean, just like you're talking to me, okay, I want you to write a sinner's prayer, put to a poem, put to music, and I want you to teach the world. Hmm. And I was like, uh, yeah, why hasn't that been done? <laughs> you know, and so I sat down and, and, and just wrote it all. I wrote five of the six lines and I got stuck on, on line five. I went to my wife, who's also a writer and a, and a really good musician. And she popped it out. And so we co-wrote this song called The Salvation Poem. So if you go to YouTube, you'll hear all kinds of versions. Uh, we've translated it already in about 100 languages. Oh, man. Wow. And we have uh, partnered with the huge ministries. It's been, we I produced a movie in South America that ended up being, you know, huge. Uh, and uh, this song has been... Uh, you know, played all over the world with like Superbook, 700 Club. We partnered with them. We were their biggest 
you know, or one of the biggest donors to produce the Superbook series that came mm -hmm. out in the last yeah. few years. And uh, every every one of the Superbook series uh, ends with the Salvation poem being sung. And as the as what the kids are watching the Bible stories being recapped, the song is sung. So uh, it has just been amazing how it's been uh, accepted all over the world by so many different languages. My wife, bless her heart, locked the keys uh, in my uh, GMC when we were out of town one time at a gas station. And so I called OnStar. And uh, I believe that it, it happened on purpose because uh, because of how it ended, the story ended. So I called OnStar. I said, hey, my wife accidentally locked the, my keys in the car. Can you unlock the vehicle? She says, sure, give me some information. So I gave her the information. And she says, uh, this could take a couple minutes. So while we're waiting, is there anything else I can help you with? I said, yeah, I can hear that you have... Uh, you have an accent. Uh, you're in another country. I, I take it. She says, "Yes, I'm in the Philippines." I said, "Oh." I said, "Do you, uh, by chance, speak Tagalog, which is one of the national languages, the main national language in the Philippines, Tagalog?" And she says, "Yeah, that's my that's my first language." I said, "I said, well, uh, my wife and I wrote a song, and uh, it was translated into Tagalog, and we understand it's uh, been pretty popular in the Philippines." And she says, "Oh, what's the name of it?" And I said, it's called The Salvation Poem. And there was this pause for a second. You could tell she was thinking. And she goes, sing a little bit of it. <laughs> so I did. And she goes, my kids sing that to me every night before they go to bed. Oh, man. So wow. here's this here's this sinner's prayer that her kids are singing. It, it's in their heart, you know. And whether they, whether they give their life to Christ or not, they're going to know the song. They're going to know how to give their life to Christ. So, this, so the words are, Jesus, you died upon a cross. And rose again to save the lost. Forgive me now of all my sin. Come be my Savior, Lord, and friend. Change my life and make it new. And help me, Lord, to live for you. So that's the salvation poem. These kids, they it's like Mary had a little lamb. Yeah. You guys can't forget it, can you? Can't forget it. Nah. So that's what God shared. In fact, God, that's what God brought to my mind when I wrote it. He said, just like Mary had a little, and I went, lamb. He said... You teach these kids this, it'll never leave them. And they'll know how to lead others to Christ. And they'll know how to give their life to Christ if they, at some point in their life, really want to. But kids are so, what's beautiful about kids is they're so trusting and they're so accepting of things that many of them, I believe, will mean it in their heart from an early yeah. age. Yeah. And it will help change them from the beginning. And so uh, that's huge. Uh, it's we We've got to figure it out that it's about... About one out of seven people in the world have heard that sinner's prayer already, and wow, which incredible. is pretty huge, you know. And uh, my wife and I, we had met in music group, uh, so we were still able to fulfill some of our music, you know. Uh, and plus, we we've written a lot of other songs. If you if you type in Matt and Sherry McPherson in yeah. YouTube music, yeah. you know, you can hear our music for free. We we download it, but but then uh, we produced movies, and there was something that I in the late '90s I heard God say. Uh, I want you to produce a uh, a new movie about the life of Jesus someday. I was like, I get it. I make bows. I make guitars. Why not films, right? <laughs> and uh, I was just like, okay, God, you'll make it clear to me. Well, it just became cl very clear to me two years ago. And we ended up hiring uh, a, a tremendous producer, high level producer, who came in and I said, this has been this has been something God put in my heart. And he was the perfect guy to do this. And so we're in the process of producing this. I'm fully funding the movie. It's a 20 million plus uh, movie. And we're going to hit theaters uh, about a year and a half from now. Mm, it's wow. called Light of the World. Wow. Because Jesus was the light of the world. And um, our goal is to win awards. If we can win awards, we have some of the top, some top Disney uh, animators doing this. It, it will be animation, not CGI, but it'll be animation, mm -hmm. which is the the kind of, it's kind of the kind of art that will will play for many, many, many years where CGI becomes very old looking very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, true animation looks uh, like art. Yeah. And so if we can win awards, it'll open countless doors around the world to be played uh, in secular countries. And so we were working with some of the top ministries and they are, are ready and very excited about using it once it becomes available. And we're going to translate it hopefully into thousands of languages. Man, that's Man. awesome. That's Matt, awesome. thank you so much for using your gifts for the Lord. I mean, just, uh, I, I mean, I have no doubt that your reach is, I mean, the, the Lord's 
using you uh, far beyond what you can even imagine. I mean, and just, um, I know that it's impacted my life with the, the, to, to be able to be exposed to a businessman who makes excellent things and then use that money that, that is from the missions bows for missions. I mean, that, that was hugely impactful in my life. And I just want to thank you. And also thank you for um, just kind of hanging out with us for a little bit today. I, I do want to. I do want to mention that I, I really believe that God can do absolutely amazing things with everybody who's listening to this. Don't doubt the fact that God, who made this universe and knows how many hairs are on your head, can can use you. You have to make yourself willing, and you have to make yourself available. So I would just challenge everybody uh, to just say, God, don't pass me by. Mm. Use me in a powerful way. Oh, that's right. good. Well, man, this has been a great conversation. Uh, Matt, I really appreciate you uh, carving out time to join us to share life and share your story, share your passion for the gospel and to make that uh, gospel known to the nations. Um, man, uh, true, true worship, you know, is, is making good instruments, making good bows. Uh, man, that is true worship. And out of the overflow of that, the Lord is using that to, um, to bring others to himself, I think, you know, and, uh, I think it's John Stott who talks about, you know, when we worship, that leads to witness. And every time we witness, that leads to more worship. And it's just this cyclical thing that just yeah. continues to go. And, man, you have, uh, through your your faithfulness, has uh, started that on that that road. And it's perpetual. And it will go long after you're, you're gone. It will continue on. Instruments that were built by you, you guys will continue to resonate with the sounds of worship. That's um, our goal. You know, bows will draw people together at hunting camps that share stories together, that share life together, make memories together, that hopefully fathers will will share with their sons and their daughters, you know, what the Lord has done, or, or they will marvel at creation and go, look what God has done as he made this and lets us be a part of it. So, man, we just really appreciate the work that you're doing. We're deeply inspired, you know, by this conversation and what we we hope as this conversation inspires some others. Maybe there's some others that need to hear exactly what you had to say today. And we hope it inspires them to um, write down their stories, share their adventures in the place we love to call the storied outdoors. That's awesome.